So if we're interested in doing arthroscopy, even though this is one tendon that you could probably approach through a deltopectoral split and not actually interfere with the deltoid, there are many times the subscapularis is part of greater pathology, and it would be nice to be able to approach this problem arthroscopically as part of the uh, accumulating experience and how to deal with rotated cuffs with an arthroscope. So Ben gives me the talk, the neglected cuff, and that one of the reasons is we tend to miss this problem. We might miss it arthroscopically, we might miss it open, we might miss it with MRI. These are the companies, again, that uh, I've had some work for, and um, the list hasn't changed since the first talk, unfortunately. Uh, arthroscopy. So why do we miss it? Well, the literature is not so easy. Uh, we know a little bit about results of the subscapularis and the, and the combination of subscapularis supraspinatus tears. The MRI is different because we're no longer looking at the coronal sections where the supraspinatus goes over the humeral head, which is the most common focal point. Here we're looking at the same cuts that you're looking at at your bank heart lesions with your labrum anteriorly or your transverse cuts. And that this is not so easy to understand when we get to the most common problem in the subscapularis, which is the superior border. And so the, sup the subscapularis muscle portion inferiorly and part of the tendon superiorly can be intact. But as it starts getting closer to the coracoid process, the question is, where does the subscapularis supposed to end? And so these things are not always so easy to see on MRIs unless we have a good experience with our radiologists and good communication. We also have to know that when we stick a scope in the back of a shoulder, we're looking at the posterior capsule ligaments, and we may not always appreciate pathology behind the capsule ligaments, which would be the uh, subscapularis. So this would be maybe the best view to understand anatomy with the scope posteriorly in a right shoulder. We see the biceps. We see the medial pulley system which is portions of the superior glenohumeral ligament. And we see this articular view of the subscapularis tendon as it enters up to the humeral head. And some of the physical findings that may tip our hand that there's a subscapularis tear is the liftoff test posteriorly. If you pull that wrist away from the patient and he's able to maintain it without using his triceps, that would be a good thing, if it, meaning his internal rotation strength. This is a little bit more reliable for people in my town, particularly as they get a little thicker from front to back. If they get press on their belly and you lift their arms away, they'll collapse their elbow next to their side because they compensate for weakness in internal rotation. And so that would be subscapularis or internal rotation weakness and perhaps the subscapularis tears the cause. As you start getting into big time tears, these people can become markedly disabled. Look at the right shoulder on this individual, lost his ability to elevate, lost his ability to internally rotate with this massive uh, tear that includes the subscapularis. And we also should look with our MRIs. One tip of the hand would be the biceps out of the groove. That would almost always suggest some degree of pathology to your subscapularis. We may also see some features of the atrophy in the subscap, similar to what we spoke about earlier with supraspinatus and infraspinatus as well. When we're dealing with arthroscopic portals, whether you do it in the beach chair or the lateral decubitus, it would be the same. We want posterior, lateral, and anterior access. And in fact, we'll need additional anterior portals to deal with this. Um, to get anchors because remember we're not going to the greater tuberosity but we're going to repair this to the lesser tuberosity. And we really have, I think people want to argue whether it's better to do the scope from the posterior portal in articular view or is it better to go in the subacromial space and either use a lateral or an anterior portal to look down the subscapularis. I think the repair is the same regardless. This is the viewing techniques you want. Do you want to view it from posteriorly or view it from anteriorly? I think it's dealer's choice. The actual reparative technique is really the same. It's just how well can you see the lesser tuberosity and how well can you see the subscapularis. But if you are going to use an articular view, here's the scope posteriorly on a right shoulder. We're just breaking down the capsule here. We're going to make a little window. And now we can internally rotate and watch the humeral head sort of separate from the, uh, from the subscapularis. Now we are looking, pushing the scope through the window and looking on the exterior of the subscapularis. And we could actually look at, in this case, an intact subscapularis on its footprint. And so again, this is just a viewing portal on whether or not you want to use the articular viewing portal or the extra articular or bursal viewing portal. 
However, as your tendon retracts, I don't know that you could get to see what you're looking for as it goes medially and inferiorly. This is a patient who had a lesser tuberosity avulsion. He's 13 years old. And it wasn't really a subscap tear, but it was a subscap avulsion along with his growth plate and his lesser that was uh, adherent to his axillary nerve that needed a bursal approach to take the bone off of his nerve and replace it back where it belongs. So there may be worthwhile classifications, sometimes are a little bit onerous, but maybe it's worthwhile to understand, should the scope do it from inside the joint or should we be doing it from a bursal portal? Well, if it's a superior border subscap tear, we probably can do either a partial or full thickness tear with the scope in the posterior portal. Complete tendon but minimally retracted, we could again attack this with the scope inside the shoulder, but we really do need the bursal approach when it becomes an inferior or medial retraction where it goes below the coracoid or inferiorly. And so if we're going to place anchors, we work from inferiorly to superiorly. We again try to cover the footprint. I'm not sure many speakers will get to talk about double rows. It's not a, that easy to do and not that it's, it's already a complex operation that some of us should just make a little deltopectoral incision and finish the operation that way. So let's go through the 63-year-old golfer. This is his left shoulder. We're showing with internal rotation how that subscap just peels off. And so it hasn't really retracted very much. And perhaps if we just probe this, we could see from this window approach both sides of the tendon. We could look at the articular side of the tendon, and we could look at the bursal side of the tendon. And so we're just using just a switching stick to probe it after we freed up some adhesions. That other abrasion on the humeral head is probably from the biceps subluxing. And now we're looking at it from the bursal approach. And so we can see what the outside of the subscapularis looks like. We can see the footprint. But again, we're just getting a bursal view of the subscapularis tendon. Whether you leave the scope in this portal or you go back to the articular view, I think it's your choice. But here we're going to take this cannula, and what we'll do is we'll withdraw the cannula so it's exterior to the subscapularis when we create the window, and now this cannula allows us to get on both the bursal aspect of the tendon as well as the articular side. Through a separate puncture hole, we can put a suture anchor in of your choice. In this case, we're really just fixing the superior border of the subscapularis, and whether you use uh, braided suture seems to be what we often are using now. And now we can use our cannula to introduce uh, puncture instruments. In this case, it could be suture hooks, it could be piercing instruments. And whether or not we choose to shuttle our sutures through our tendon, probably better to use mattress sutures to pull this tendon up and get the maximum excursion effect of elevating the subscapularis and, and putting as much of this tendon across that footprint that you learned about earlier. So there's a mattress suture. You can see we're tightening it up and we try to get it back on top. The problem with these retracted tissues are they become medialized, and this is the comma sign, which means that you have portions of the pulley, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the subscapularis has all fallen down medially, and we need to do some mobilization of this to get it back to its lesser tuberosity, similar to what you saw with the greater tuberosity. So tendon mobilization, here is that comma. We're now lifting the subscapularis, it's lateral decubitus. And now if you could put your cannula anteriorly, you could see how where the subscapularis is going to go. It may be wise just to put a suture through that lateral border so you have something to pull up on while you're trying to work through that window medially. And now we've got a little cautery instrument. We're opening up the, uh, the window medially, and we're probably going to come down right on the coracoid process and remove any adhesions to the coracoid. And these are techniques just like you learn to mobilize the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. I'm cutting the middle capsule ligament. We want to get a little careful as we get to the inferior border because your axillary nerve is fairly close by along the inferior border. And now here we are, we've passed our sutures through. We have some soft tissue connections to the bursa we don't like, but at least we got it back on the footprint and we left the biceps in place, which is sometimes a nuisance. Some people will automatically cut the biceps in these cases and decide tenotomy or tenodesis. And now I'm just removing any soft tissue connections with the undersurface of the deltoid to the cuff repair so that there won't be any stiffness in the shoulder, at least based on our suture placement. And we may go medially. Here we are working through the uh, notch at the coracoid process, and we're taking the superior border, the subscapularis, and we've got to be a little careful as we're getting medially, but we want to make sure there's no adhesions of the subscapularis as it retracts. In this case, we have a pull stitch on the subscapularis, so we're pulling the subscap out while we're mobilizing medially. 
and we may do something to the coracoid. In this case, through the window, we can actually take portions of the coracoid. I don't think this is a routine part of the operation, but sometimes we need the working space, and so we'll get, define the space a little bit better if we can work outside of the subscapularis, leave the soft tissue attachments alone, other than those to the subscapularis. And here's the bursal view for this case where we may want to have a medially retracted tear laterally. We'll put a suture through this and now we'll put our anchors in. And here we are, this is the, uh, after we freed this t uh, tuberosity off of the nerve, uh, which retracted anteriorly and medially, and we'll take the subscapularis. And this is the, probably the only view we could have gotten to get this kind of a view of the subscap repair onto the, uh, now the footprint in this adolescent uh, patient. So there is reasons to do articular views and there are reasons to do bursal views. And I think again, it's, a, it's the same operation, it's just how do you view your pathology and how do you mobilize the tendon. Here we go with the biceps. Look at the defect on the humeral head. That's not your lesser tuberosity. That defect on the humeral head, if you don't believe I've just made it, is actually the biceps tendon snapping across and creating that uh, defect. So you don't want to believe that that's your lesser tuberosity. That's actually a defect that occurred uh, because of the biceps. And here we are, we cut the biceps and repair it to the, this is probably to the supraspinatus, uh, similar to what John Richmond spoke about a little bit earlier. Postoperatively, you want to limit your external rotation. Here's a patient with a subscap view. He has, looks like his good belly press, although I'm not yanking on his wrist like I should be, but he can lift off correctly. We go with pendulums. We limit his external rotation in this case because we don't want him to uh, damage his repair, and we use the same time frame of limited motion. So to conclude on subscapularis, again, it's about 10 tear patterns. Most of these are crescent-shaped tears. Whether or not you view the problem from the articular surface or from the bursal surface, you need to be able to manage the tendon on both sides. And so creating that window in the rotator interval may be a way of leaving the scope articular and seeing both sides of the tendon. And the biceps is clearly a problem in lots of subscapularis injuries. And so you need to be prepared to either tenotomize tenodes or leave it alone. And that's just your choice at the time. But it's not that much fun to go back to operations after a patient's still having problems because their cuff is healed and their biceps is not a happy biceps. So maybe the index operation is the correct time to take care of this problem. Thanks for your attention.